We're very happy today to have a lay speaker, someone that most of you know. Ann Lowe Smith grew up an active member of Daveville First United Methodist Church. I had the pleasure of talking to her about some of the people who were active in church at that time. And uh, of course, close friend uh, Sherry Bashong is not here today, but would, would love to have been here, uh, Ann. Her professional life has been spent in the arena of science, education, and DNA technology. Currently, Ann is a homemaker. In 2008, Ann was diagnosed with leukemia. She experienced a miraculous healing of body and soul. Ann is convinced that the intimate works of God in her story must be told. She began this journey in February of 2018 by telling her story in blog form. As the story reaches its end, Anne will continue to blog encouraging posts and biblical content. In addition to her blog, Anne is broadcasting her impact through speaking engagements. You can read Anne's blog at annsmith.com. Anne loves interacting with people and will enjoy hearing from you. She may be contacted at Anne at annsmith.com. I know many of you know her. Uh, from many years ago and know the story now and I'm interested in hearing it and uh, I know you came to Camp Ask a long time ago uh, as did Sherry and then many people have since that time but uh, we're looking and excited to, to hear from you now thank you for joining us so I have to start with the fact that being here today is like going home I spent so much time in this church. I remember being in all of these pews, passing notes to my friends. A little later, I sat in that balcony and held hands with boys. Mi you know, middle school, high school. The best memory, not even getting married here was the best, but that was great. The best memory was sitting right up there and I'm looking now and I don't know if we were behind that little screen or if there was a bigger screen my recollection was it was much bigger Jennifer it was bigger Jennifer Treadwell and I climb we get in the back of the church downstairs we climb up these steps in the dark and I think we ended climbing a ladder and we wound up sitting right behind that screen and watching you guys at church on Sunday night <laughs> And, you know, this is not something that um, was that unusual, I found out, as my children were being raised in our church. They did similar things that I heard about later. So, it is such an honor to be here, such a treat to be here, and to see so many familiar faces. I'm, I'm so happy to be here, and thank you so much for coming. So, experiencing peace and joy in the midst of panic and fear is an amazing thing. It's something that you can get through Christ. I lived with panic and fear, hopelessness, despair for a period of time. When I couldn't take it any longer, I surrendered to death, to life, to whatever he had in plan, what his plan was. I just jumped, I surrendered. In the summer of 2008, I was walking along a bright, sunny sidewalk. I moped into the office of Deborah Leaf. Her office was dark, it was cool, it was serene. I moped over to the chair that was designated for me. I plopped down and dropped my purse to the floor. With a wilted face, I described to Deborah everything that my condition involved. She watched me very intently. Her response? <sighs> That's a lot. I heard inside my head a voice say, are you kidding me? That's all you got? That was my disturbing introduction to Deborah Leaf, my counselor. Over the several weeks 
past that. Deborah would say things to me that I did not understand. She said, Ann, you're at the edge. Okay, I'm just talking about. You're at the edge of a cliff, Ann. And then finally she said, on down the road, she said, when you jump, you're going to soar. Okay, no idea what she was talking about. Three months prior to that, I had been in my classroom. Goodbye, have a good trip, be careful, see you in a week to my students as they were leaving for spring break. And silently I prayed for them as I did every year that they would all be well and return okay, happy, healthy, safe the week after. The week following that, I was in the waiting room of Dr. Sultan, a hematology oncologist. So this is a blood doctor who also treats cancer. I had been unofficially diagnosed with hemochromatosis, which would have been a great diagnose, or diagnosis uh, in contrast to what turned out to happen. Hemochromatosis is simply your body retains iron. The quick fixes, they just bleed you to get rid of some iron and they monitor and bleed whenever they need to. Who knew bleeding was really a thing? So they bleed people. So I sat there in that office. I looked around, I'm, I'm in the waiting room and I looked around at the people. Cancer was everywhere. I began to get a little nervous. I kept looking. It seemed as if cancer were just seeping into my skin. My heart started to race. I stopped and told myself, you do not have cancer. You have hemochromatosis. Get in there, get your diagnose, diagnosis, and get out of here. I do not have cancer. A little bit later, I was in the office of Dr. Sultan. He confirmed that, yes, he thinks I have hemochromatosis. So he's getting ready to dismiss me, and he says, oh, wait just a minute, let me go look at your blood smear. He leaves. I get on my jacket, I got my purse, I am good to go, I have hemochromatosis, all is well. So he returns, and he says, sit back down. Uh-oh. I sat down, and he started describing what he saw in my blood. He saw pieces and parts of unformed white blood cells. He saw an excess of white blood cells. He said, Ann, your blood is filling up with white blood cells, and it won't be able to function with this many white blood cells. Are you talking cancer? Yes, but curable. I heard that word curable, and my head grabbed that word and held on. Even though I knew, curable doesn't mean cured, and it doesn't mean everything's okay. I pulled myself back together and said, I have three children at home, I can't have cancer. Like that was a logical statement. He ignored that, kept going. He described what would happen now. I had to have a bone marrow biopsy today to be shipped out at noon. It would be done in his office with only local anesthesia. Now, I didn't know a whole lot about bone marrow biopsies at that time, but I did know that they were going to stick a large bore needle and pound it into my pelvic bone and suck out bone marrow and later I found out they even chip away a piece of bone and retrieve it. So that's what I was looking at. The knot in my throat swole to the size of a baseball. My lips were quivering. They escorted me to a private office to call my husband. I had to have someone to come pick me up. I got to the office picked up the phone. When I heard his voice, everything fell out. I cried, I sobbed, I said a bunch of words, and cancer finally came out. And his reality was, 
he didn't see cancer. He saw she's upset. She's exaggerated whatever's been said to her. It's, it, I'm going to go, he's going to go fix it, right? Isn't that what men do? They go fix it? So Tim was coming to fix it. He got there and they seated him in the hall outside of the room. I was taken into this room, put on my stomach. They began to put in the local anesthesia shots. I had a nurse holding my hand and patting my shoulder gently. I cried, I screamed, and I yelled like a crazy woman. There was no shame. I didn't care. I was losing it. I had cancer, I have three kids, and now they're pounding on my back. I don't even care about that. I have bigger problems than pounding on my back right now. So Tim and Dr. Sultan come back in. Dr. Sultan begins to tell us what's going to happen now. I have to go into the hospital for a three to four week treatment. Following that, I would have another five days and another five days and another five days for a total of eight different rounds. Each of the five days would be 21 days apart. A few days later, I met Dr. Hannah Jean Curry at Emory University. He was very encouraging about my treatments. He did mention that transplant might be something that we have to do down the road. I wanted to know what kind of chances are we talking about having a transplant. We're talking about the old bone marrow transplant that now typically is done as a stem cell transplant. He said 40% chance of being alive five years out. That was not good enough for me. I shut that down in my head right then. We're not doing that. So he did convince me though that we need to have options. We need to have a backup. My sister was tested and she was not a match. My brother was tested and he was a good match. Amazing. And most of you know my brother was in an accident 10 years before that. Miraculously lived. He was not supposed to live. He was not supposed to walk. He was not supposed to talk. He lived and he was a perfect match 10 years later for me. When Dr. Curry found out that Paul was a good match, I was about in the second or third treatment at that point. He jumped on that. We need to stop these rounds. You're in a good remission right now. We need to stop it. We need to have this transplant right now. I was horrified. I thought you said this is way out there. I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm, I don't want to do that. Oh, but, 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 but. We need to do this now. I cried. I saw him at least every Friday. Every time he brought it up, I just broke down. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So it was put off, put off, put off. That 40%, I attempted to get him to break that down for me. What do those 40% people that are alive look like five years out? What do they look like? He wouldn't break it down for me. He wouldn't give me what I wanted. My friend, Dr. Joanne Cox, went into a meeting with me. We knew pretty quickly that he was not happy about her presence. She had her notebook, she had her pen, and she very methodically asked him questions. What percent this, what percent that? He started with something that I already knew, but so rudely explained to us that the first 20% are gonna die in the first 100 days off the top, young, old, in remission or not in remission when they went in. 20% are going to die first 100 days. I have a woman over there right now, she's going to die, she's going to be part of that 20%. I was floored, not Joanne. She kept keeping up with her little notes. She maintained her composure. 
He went on to describe the people who survive. Some are huge on steroids to control graft versus host disease. They can't walk. Others are in wheelchairs being strolled in to the hospital every week to get blood because they can't make their own. Others, their skin is getting hard and thick and they're drawing up. He finished his explanation with, they're really rather pitiful. Again, I'm horrified. Joanne's making her notes. We finish this meeting. We walk out in the hall. I look up at Joanne. Up, of course, I'm five feet tall. I look up at Joanne. Joanne, would you do that? No, I would not do that. Dr. Curry had given me in my many, many crying sessions with him, he had said, you can go to MD Anderson and get a second opinion if you want. He had also, during all those sessions, he had said, you can stay on Gleevec. You have another option. You can stay on Gleevec if you want to. You will run the risk of developing a mutation that we have nothing to treat it with. So I knew that was an option, but it was never what he had promoted. He promoted transplant. This is your only way for a cure. MD Anderson had been mentioned as an option. Dr. Contargian knows all about Gleevec. Joanne and I decided it's time to go to MD Anderson. It was gonna take two to three months to get all the paperwork and finances in order to get to MD Anderson. Meanwhile, I'm slipping into a depression. I go into a deep depression. I sat every day that I wasn't on the road going to the hospital or for another blood check or whatever. I would sit, I would attempt to engage in TV. Nope. Nothing. Try to read. Nothing. Gone. I would try to take a nap. Maybe I can just pass a little time napping. Once I started to doze, my body would jolt awake and relive my current condition. That was the way I spent my days. At six or seven o'clock in the evening, I would begin to get giddy because it's time for my sleeping pill. I was ready to go to sleep. I asked Deborah Leaf, is that okay? That I want the sleeping pill so bad? She said, yes, your brain needs to turn off. Your brain's busy all day. You need to turn your brain off at night and that's the way you can do it. So I would take my sleeping pill. I would lay down, I would lay on my back. I don't go to sleep on my back very well. If I was on my stomach, I'd be out. I would lay on my back. I would beg. I would reason and justify why I should live. Why this, this should not be happening and I need to live. I cried and begged every night. When I was done, I was satisfied with everything I'd gotten out. I would turn over onto my stomach and sometimes I would, I would pat the bed and say, just sit with me. Holy Spirit, just sit with me. That was the communication that was going on during that deepest, deepest darkness. However, one night, I got my giddy sleeping pill. I lay down and I go through my process of crying and begging. And I finally say to him, if I die, it's, it's just you and me. None of these people matter anymore. It's just you and me. Hmm. If I live, it's just you and me. Wow. A big smile came over my face. Joy, peace, it's just you and me. That personal relationship, he sees me, he knows me, it's just us. I turned over and went to sleep 
with peace and joy. The next night, I took my sleeping pill, I got in the bed, I laid back, an involuntary smile came across my face. I'm here, I'm back. I was back in peace and joy with Christ. From there, every day, of course, every moment of every day is not peace and joy for any of us. We're humans, that's not gonna happen. However, I can return with just you and me, I can return to his presence instantly and have peace and joy. So Joanne went with me and Tim to MD Anderson. We went to MD Anderson, we talked to Dr. Contargian who told me, if I were you, I would stay on Gleevec. You've got a 40% chance of being alive in five years staying on Gleevec. I thought, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course, Dr. Curry hadn't really thrown that in there. And of course, I knew I was taking that chance that I would have that small mutation that would not be treatable. At that point in time, I was very disappointed with Dr. Curry at Emory. I was very unhappy with that man. I did not like him. My friends did not like him. In fact, one told me many times and still will tell me, he was trying to kill you, Ann. What I, the way I reason his actions, he's a research doctor at a research hospital. He needs numbers, right? You need a big baseline of numbers in your research. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad, it's research, it's information that we're gathering. Did it really matter to him if I was a negative? He had his number. So that was the way I reasoned how he had promoted transplant so adamantly. I asked Dr. Contargian at MD Anderson, is there another doctor in Atlanta that I can go to besides Dr. Curry? I don't trust him. Nope, he's your guy. Are you kidding me? In all of Atlanta, he's my guy? That's it? I had to stay with Dr. Curry. I was really mad about that. Joanne wasn't happy about it either. So I go back to see Dr. Curry. Of course he acted as if Gleevec had been on the table. His, his, he, that was his great idea the whole time. Nope. And I'm sure if I had ever confronted him specifically, he would have said, oh, I always gave you the option for Gleevec. That's not the, way it, not the way it happened for me or for Joanne or my mother-in-law who was with me in a lot of my appointments. <coughs> so we stay on Gleevec. I finish my rounds and in January of 2009, I go back to teaching, I go back to being mom, back to being wife, back to my life. And I had decided months earlier that there's no bucket list. There is no bucket list. The bucket list is I want my old life back. I want to go to some stupid meeting that I have to sit for an hour and listen to something I don't want to listen to. That's, that's normal. That, I want to go back there. So I returned there in January of 2009. I swam with dolphins with my whole family that summer. My husband was adamant, if you want the whole family to swim with dolphins, we're going to swim with dolphins. It was great. On the way back from swimming with dolphins, we stopped at my sister's house in Jacksonville. And while there, standing in a public shopping center, I received the call with the results from my last DNA test. It's coming back. But you know what? At that point, I knew it's go time. I don't have any options. I have to do this. And if you are requiring this of me, I will do it to my best ability and to your glory. It was go time. I had the transplant in September of 2009. Zero complications. I didn't go back to the hospital once with an infection. I didn't have any graft versus host disease. And they want you to have that, which simply means that Paul's blood in my body 
would be attacking anything foreign but not me. So graph versus host is attacking the host. They wanted you to have a little bit of that so that it would recognize the leukemia cell that my body had failed to recognize. I didn't even have any of that. People were expected to be in and out of the hospital and to have a one-year recovery period. I had nothing. It was like this miraculous thing. By this time, Dr. Curry and I had grown to have a mutual respect and appreciation for each other. He was amazed at how well I was doing with all of this. He had me speak eventually to a class of nurses at Emory, describing the experience for the family. <clears throat> he was very interested in the way it affects the entire family. I spoke to four different medical student classes that he had there. He wanted me to come and tell them each year what this was like. Of course, we were developing a really good mutual respect and appreciation for each other at that point. He even called me and asked me to call a woman in the UK whose doctors wanted her to have a transplant and he thought she should stay on Gleevec. And he wanted me to call her and tell her about my experience. And I did. He had a deep respect and appreciation for where I had been, what I had chosen to do. And then in September of 16, I was still having testing done until September of 17. So just less than a year ago, I was still having tests. September of 16, I went in to see Dr. Curry and I was only seeing him every six months. He asked me, do you, do, you, do you know what's going on with me? No, no, I don't know what's happening. I don't come very often. I, don't, I haven't been. No, I don't know. I have esophageal cancer. He was 50 years old, perfect picture of health. Esophageal cancer. I encouraged him, gave him a hug, and knew that I would be back in six months for blood work, but not to see him. So six months later, I go back in. I'm having my blood work, but I'm gonna see Dr. Curry. I'm gonna go see Dr. Curry and I'm gonna give him a hug. I get up to his office. The nurse tells me that he's on medical leave. And my hope was that he would be in one of those low points of the ups and downs of cancer treatments. A couple of months later, I received the letter that Dr. Curry had passed away. I was devastated. The people that I had had transplants with, they were dead. They were gone. Now, the man who helped me survive was gone. Survivor's guilt is a real thing. It's not logical. But it's a real thing. So perhaps to survive the one who helped you survive is the ultimate survivor's guilt. So let's jump out of the sadness of that situation and go back to peace and joy. Dr. Leaf, what did she tell me? You're going to jump and you're going to soar. I soared. When I jumped, I soared. I had peace and I had joy in the midst of, it looked like possible death. I had peace and joy. When you look at surrender, who are you surrendering to? Could I surrender to a human being? Well, a human being will fail you, right? Why? Because we are a fallen people. We are, we're fallen. We're not perfect. We never will be. And another human being will fail you. Christ will not fail you. I knew who I was surrendering to. 
This is God who told Joshua and Isaiah repeatedly, do not fear, do not be dismayed. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That was one of my verses that I held on to. He also talked about angels being ministering spirits that he sends down. I prayed for that over my body many times. I think one of my favorites, I've, two of these are my, they're all my favorites maybe, but the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. If the angel of the Lord is around you, he's protecting you. If he's encamping there, he's staying there. This is who I'm surrendering to. And then the Holy Spirit, one of the, our triune God, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us to the whole with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit sees me, knows me, feels me, and goes to the whole of the Trinity on my behalf with such passion that it cannot even be put into words. It's simple groanings for Anne, groanings for you. He sees you. He knows you. And when you surrender to him, peace and joy is a result. You can soar. In those times of battles, of hardships, consider him. Go to scripture. Find out who he is. Find out his character. Find out what he thinks about you. How he feels about you and consider surrender to him. The best place you can be is right in the middle of the will of God for your life. And don't forget, you can jump and you can soar. Thank you.